Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, this is for you to start before your remarks. Oh, President Brewer, stay there. I don't like those people. Take it away. Good afternoon. My name is Christian Klosner, Executive Director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Special Enforcement, also known as OSE. Housed within the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, OSE is a multi-agency task force that uses inspections, litigation, and education to address quality of life situations that cannot be adequately addressed by a single agency. OSE's work focuses on stemming the proliferation of illegal short-term rentals in New York City. Short-term rentals are rentals for fewer than 30 consecutive days, and state and city laws only allow homes to be rented for up to two guests and only when the host is staying with the guests. Entire home short-term rentals and those for more than two guests are illegal. They take housing away from New Yorkers, they endanger the tourists who book and stay there, and they disrupt the quality of life for our neighbors. I am pleased to be here with the mayor and allies to announce that today we are filing a lawsuit to stop just such an illegal operation. The building behind me, 344 East 51st Street, is supposed to be a home for eight families and a doctor's office. Instead, data obtained from Airbnb shows it has been the home of a major illegal short-term rental operation. This operation was run by Aaron Latimer, a licensed real estate broker trained in the laws and rules governing real estate. Over a four-year period, Latimer has received over $2 million in payouts from Airbnb for illegal short-term rentals, most of which occurred in this building behind us. He has used over 28 distinct host accounts, many of which used either fake names or other people's names, despite Airbnb indicating it had verified the host's identities. He operated approximately 78 listings, nearly all of which used a false address in an apparent attempt to cover up illegal activity. Latimer used 10 different LLCs, each with its own bank account and set up with Latimer as the signatory to receive the payments for over 2,200 illegal transactions. And he deceived over 6,500 people visiting our great city by providing them with unsafe and illegal accommodations. Esther Yip, also a defendant in the lawsuit, through her LLC, Apex East Management, owns this building and allowed the operation to continue despite repeated rounds of enforcement. The city is seeking an order from the court to immediately restrain these defendants from continuing their illegal acts and will seek penalties sufficient to recoup the ill-gotten gains and make clear that violating the law can be an expensive proposition. Identifying this large-scale operation would not have been possible without the data obtained from Airbnb and provided pursuant to the city's booking service data reporting law. And bringing this case would not have been possible without the ongoing commitment of Mayor Adams to preserve our, house, our housing and hold illegal operators accountable. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce New York City Mayor Eric Adams. Thank you. Thank you. Well said, well said. Thank you so much. Uh, this investigation is one of many uh, that this organization is conducting so we can identify those who are depriving taxpayers and depriving our housing stock. And I'm happy to be joined here with so many colleagues in government and advocates in this area. Uh, what I want to do first, though, I think it's important to touch on um, our COVID uh, numbers and what are we doing around COVID. Uh, it's important that uh, we're still... COVID is a formidable opponent. I cannot say this enough. Uh, new variants continue uh, to uh, enter our country and our city. Uh, but it's preparation, not panic. Preparations, 
not panic. It is something I stated over and over again. We still have to function. I said this in January. Uh, we have to learn to live with COVID. We're not out of the woods. It's still here, and it's still uh, impacting our lives, and so we have to take the proper steps. Uh, the new variants, we are seeing higher rates of community transmission, and as well as reinfection. Um, you know, people I know who have had COVID are reinfected, uh, but because of the tools we have available, we're able to combat this. Uh, we're not seeing the, the, the level of fatalities that we've witnessed when we did not have those tools. And New Yorkers just should take necessary precautions. Um, or in my briefing this morning, we talk about masking on the subway or in, in, indoors uh, to continue to uh, encourage New Yorkers to do the right thing. Uh, we want them to use high-quality masks in public settings and continue uh, to just wash your hands, do some of the basic things that we have been successful at doing. And if you're eligible, get vaccinated and or boosted, that's important. That's how we have pushed back the previous variants. And we, we're telling people if you come down with the symptoms, isolate immediately and take advantage of the free at-home tests that are being distributed around the city with more than uh, 1,200 sites. And I'm happy to announce today uh, another evolution of what we're doing, our amazing medical team. Uh, we are partnering with Test and Trace, and we will be distributing uh, 35,000 at-home tests through the Department of Parks and Recreation. So we're using every a part of our city government to get the tests to individuals in all five boroughs as select parks, recreation centers, uh, net nature events and centers, and at our pools. The antiviral treatments are available for free for those people who are, who are eligible and qualified. Uh, this is where unique with our delivery service and what we're doing. We're leading the entire country in doing this, and so it's important that New Yorkers know, as I stated, we are, we're not out of, out of the woods, but we will be prepared and we won't panic as we continue to understand the complexity of COVID and as we know we have to learn to live with COVID as we keep our city operating. But back to today's topic on OSC short-term uh, rental lawsuit. Uh, this is the power of government working in the right way. Today is taking actions to shut down an illegal short-term uh, rentals and protect our visitors, our communities, and our hospitality industry. These short-term illegal rentals have a major impact on our hospitality industry and those who are employed in the industry. And we're starting right here on East 51st Street. This, this building, as was indicated, was one of the largest short-term rental operations in the city in 2021, and that was entirely illegal and they ignored uh, the laws and continued to operate without uh, the, the importance of understanding the enforcement that was put in place. And for years, the broker used fake host profiles and popular sites uh, to lure unsuspecting guests to our city, uh, regardless of the condition of the building and violating the law. Online Review described this building as astonishingly dirty. Uh, this is not what we expect from New Yorkers in the quality of hotels and other legal renters that we have in the city. The defendants continue to run the operations, really snubbing their nose at the law, and we're saying that snubbing of the nose at the law is ending. There are multiple violations, including hazardous conditions, is something that puts individuals in jeopardy for their safety and public, and public health. Today we're sending a message. This kind of lawlessness will not be tolerated in our city, and we're not going to stand by while shady brokers use illegal listings, fake host accounts to skirt the law and defraud customers. We're using the power of the law to protect uh, the public interest, and we're going to continue to identify these locations that are using the same method to circumvent the laws that are put in place. Uh, we're not going to let bad actors uh, despite their attitudes, they are not going to deplete our housing stock and our hospitality sector. Uh, we want to keep our visitors and communities safe, 
and make sure that New Yorkers are not deprived of their much-needed living space. Uh, the administration, our administration, is determined to preserve, preserve affordable housing and cracking down on illegal short-term renters are one way we're going to accomplish that aspect. And when I talk about law and order, I'm talking about law and order not only from violent crime, but also from those who believe they're going to have a disorderly rental market in our city. And this administration is going to tackle crime, corruption, and our business sector just as we tackle street crime. This lawsuit shows, uh, that's my cousin, I guess. This lawsuit shows exactly why we need reporting requirements for booking pl um, platforms and why the city needs short-term rental registration program that would take effect in 2023. We're, fo we're focused on this issue, and I really want to thank the Office of Special Enforcement for their great work for highlighting and moving forward with this lawsuit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our next speaker is President of the Hotel Trade Council, Rich Morocco. Good morning. Um, on behalf of the Hotel Trades Council and our tens of thousands of members who live in this city, I want to thank the Mayor, his administration, and the Office of Special Enforcement for their demonstrated unwavering support for enforcing New York City's ban on illegal short-term rentals. Now, the city's ban on these illegal short-term rentals is more important today than it's probably ever been. Because as we all know, unregulated short-term rentals take much-needed housing stock off the market, driving up rents for regular New Yorkers and making the city almost unaffordable for a large segment of our population. And make no mistake about it. We are in the midst of a housing crisis, and this is one step to help remedy that. And, of course, this illegal shadow industry also hamstrings the recovery of the legitimate hospitality industry, which is such a critical driver of our city's economy and which pro uh, produces tens of thousands of good jobs to New Yorkers who desperately needed after two years of a catastrophically hard pandemic. The law that regulates and bans illegal hotels addresses both of those issues. But the law is only as good as the individuals who are enforcing it. And today, the city has proven that it can and it will enforce those laws. And in doing so, they're showing a commitment not only to enforcing the laws, but a commitment to protecting affordable housing and a commitment to helping our hospitality industry recover and helping those that rely on that industry get back up on their feet. So thank you, Mayor Adams. Thank you to the Office of Special Enforcement. Thank you all. Thank you, President Morocco. Our next speaker is Councilmember Keith Powers, who represents this building. I mean, I represent the whole neighborhood, but I, uh, I'm always happy to welcome people to this beautiful neighborhood in the 4th Council District. Not really for this reason why, but it is a good moment here because we are um, uh, really sort of stepping up to make sure that housing in a great neighborhood like this, where there's good schools, there's good transportation, close to Midtown, close to people's jobs, is actually going to use for New Yorkers, where they can actually live. And, you know, we talk about the housing crisis, as uh, Rich mentioned, and if we're not taking, you know, basic steps to enforce illegal, illegally occupied commercial uses, then we're not even doing our basic job here in the city. And I want to say a very big thank you to the Office of Special Enforcement, because as I was talking to them, the steps that they took to be able to investigate and identify that this was an illegal operation are actually sort of extraordinary, the work they did. And it wasn't that easy, but they actually went out, and I have to say, the work that they were describing to us is actually sort of remarkable, and they deserve a lot of credit. But well, look, more importantly, we've been fighting this fight for a long time in the city to make sure that housing is available for New Yorkers, but also for people who live on this block or live in the building or live around here. 
that their neighbors actually are here, are present, and are taking care of it. This building, as you heard from the mayor, uh, I think it was astonishingly dirty or something like that. But in where I live, in Stuyvesant Town, Peter Cooper Village, we for years, a oh, decade plus, have had this fight against folks who are illegally renting their operations because it's there's people on their floor who are calling my office and complaining about transient neighbors who don't take care of the hallway that they live in or making noise or being bad neighbors. And there's no contractual agreement. There's nothing that's really binding them to be good neighbors. So we want people to be good neighbors. We want them to have good housing. We want people to follow the law. And that's what today is really about. So I want to thank the mayor for being out here. I want to thank all my colleagues. And I do want to, just before I end, give a very shout out to uh, my colleague in the assembly who's been fighting this fight for a long time, but is leaving us. Um, but I want to congratulate him on an extraordinary career, but a really uh, wonderful career fighting for New Yorkers and fighting on this issue and for housing as well. So thank you to everyone for being here. Next time, let's do something more fun in the 4th Council District. Uh, but this is a good reason to be here, too. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Our next speaker is Council Member Gail Brewer. my uh, the mayor and I were borough presidents together, so we call each other borough presidents. <laughs> um, it's really an honor to be here with you, Mr. Mayor, and with housing conservation coordinators and HTC and my colleagues, and I'll particularly, as you heard earlier, Assemblymember Dick Godfrey, because the mayor's office, Christian, the mayor's office of special enforcement, has been the go-to organization for years and years and has been so responsive. We're now housing on 97th and Broadway uh, individuals who were formerly incarcerated permanently with Fortune Society because of this amazing uh, mayoral agency. And the fact of the matter is when uh, the people arrived from all over the world to stay here illegally, it was the mayor's office of special enforcement that worked with us in a windowless room at 250 Broadway led by Dick Gottfried, where we all gathered for many, many decades, literally to work on the state and the city level. So to be here today with uh, all the power of the mayor's office behind us to say, if you're coming to New York, stay in a hotel, stay in a place that's legal. Uh, don't go to a place that is not legal. Now, I have my little story, which is it was many years ago. I was on 95th Street, and I saw people running down the street. And they had just been in an illegal hotel with lots of bugs, and their son was graduating from Columbia College. I said, what the hell is wrong with you, that you have a smart kid, but you obviously are not too smart because you have found yourself in a very illegal housing situation in the city of New York. So we've been doing this for a long time. To be here today is a gift that we are giving to the people of New York, which is a wonderful uh, agency that's paying attention to what New Yorkers really need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Our next speaker is the Assembly Member Richard Godfrey. Hi there. Thank you. Um, you know, it was around 2004 that uh, a lot of us on the west side of Manhattan, elected officials, uh, tenant groups, uh, uh, community groups, became aware of the issue of, uh, of illegal hotels, uh, short term rentals, if you will. And it was clear from the start that. These units are, are illegal. They are dangerous. It's dangerous to have strangers wandering in and out of your building with keys to the front door at all, all hours of the day and night. It's, it's, a, it's a, a building code uh, danger. Uh, there are codes that we require of hotels uh, that do not apply to apartment buildings, and, and for good reason. So there are a whole slew of reasons why illegal hotels uh, are a real problem. They keep affordable uh, housing units off the housing market. Uh, so back in 04, we found our way, luckily, to something called the Office of Special Enforcement, uh, which was already working on this issue. And I remember vividly our first meeting with them. I, I remember thinking, first of all, I had never seen such an enthusiastic group of city enforcement people so on top of an issue, so enthusiastic about getting the job done. And I remember thinking, I wonder if these people are going to get in trouble. <laughs> you know, they're so on top of their jobs, and I wasn't used to seeing that in city enforcement people. And through now 
three mayors, uh, OSE has done that job. They've had the, the strong support of three mayors now. Uh, it's enormously important. The illegal hotel law that we got passed in 2010 that I sponsored in the Assembly uh, would not have happened, couldn't have, could not have been drafted uh, without the, the technical help of people in, uh, in OSE, in the Corp Council's office, and in the Buildings Department, because they knew the intricacies of the multiple dwelling law, which is about as bizarre and intricate a law as you'll ever want to bump into. And without, without stop, they have been on the job uh, for New Yorkers ever since, and the results we're seeing today are, are part of it. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you to OSE. Uh, this is a terrific step forward. Thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Assembly Member. Our next group of speakers will be the Coalition Against Illegal Hotels, um, represented by Tom Kaler. Uh, please join. And Tom. Oh, oh, yeah. Hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Tom Kaler. I'm with the West Side Neighborhood Alliance uh, and the Coalition of Illegal Hotels. <laughs> Leslie, come on in. Vivian, my, my colleagues in this. We have been fighting illegal hotels in New York City, as Assemblyman Godfrey pointed out, since 2004. That's right, 2004. It's been 18 years that we've been working on this problem. But today, today is a bellwether day in this fight, because today, standing with us, fighting for our homes and fighting for our safety in our homes, is our mayor. And this is going to change the complex of this fight altogether. Now, illegal hotels remove housing stock from the market. but. They also compromise our safety. As New Yorkers, our safety at home is based on the fact that you know your neighbors. You know who's in your building. When you find strangers in your building, you should be afraid. No question about it. Since May of 2019, there's been 253 shootings in illegal STRs throughout this country. In New York City, we've had three of them since November of 2021. So this is now going to stop. With the reporting law that was passed in 2018, with the registration law that was passed in 2021, and with the commitment and support from our mayor standing with us, our message is clear. If you are going to operate illegal hotels in New York City, you are going to be found and you are going to be stopped. I mean, as New Yorkers, we love our tourists. We love the tourists to come to New York. This is a fabulous thing about this time. We just don't want to live with them. Besides that fact, we have world-class union hotels in this town supporting the workers and supporting all the tourists who come into this town. So let me just say to the platforms out there who are aiding and abetting, to the illegal hotel operators who are operating in this city, with the mayor at our side, your days of stealing housing in New York City are very, very numbered. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you my colleagues. Thank you. So I present it to you because I can't ever be accused of giving you something of value. Okay. Thank you, Tom, and thank you to members of the Coalition Against Illegal Hotels. Obviously, uh, you've heard a lot of support for our office. It wouldn't have been possible without the support of the folks gathered here today and others. It also would not have been possible without the support of my incredibly talented and hardworking staff. Deputy Executive Director Francine O'Keefe is here today, uh, and the countless attorneys inspectors, researchers, computer staff, and comm staff that work to put this all together. Uh, I thank you on behalf of the city. And now we'll open it up to questions and answers. Thank you. Uh, I can't recall if it was you, Mr. Mayor, or the executive director, but you mentioned that there are several investigations going on to similar situations. Can you speak a little bit to how pervasive this problem is in the city? How many investigations are we talking about? 
You know, ongoing investigations are ongoing investigations, and it's a problem that we're going to resolve. Uh, one or two illegal buildings is far too many. It erodes the confidence in our affordable housing system, our hotel industry, and as we announce these uh, lawsuits, we're going to roll them out as they um, come forward. Um, what type of repercussions could the building owner here face? Are we talking stiff financial penalties? Are we talking criminal consequences? What, what could happen to an owner? Sure. Uh, first and foremost, we've issued three rounds of violations, so they'll already, uh, once sustained at oath, be facing tens of thousands of dollars in fines. Um, the, we will seek to recoup all of the ill-gotten gains. There's a variety of causes of actions with different penalties attached, uh, but it is all civil penalties. And most importantly, we'll be seeking a, an injunction, a court order telling them to stop, um, such that if they didn't, we could then take them into court for contempt. May I toss in one other thing there for you? Uh, from your first question is, uh, uh, based, uh, based on our numbers working with uh, Murray Cox and uh, uh, based on our numbers working with uh, Murray Cox at Inside Airbnb, we estimate that there are 30,000 illegal uh, short-term rental units in New York City right now. Uh, we believe that when the registration law goes into effect in January of 2023, that that is going to drastically cut that number down. So 30,000 units, we could house all of our homeless. I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the potential penalties, um, because obviously tens of, tens of thousands of dollars in fines doesn't add up to much. If, if I heard correctly, if the owner was making about $2 million in the last two years. So how, uh, what do we need to do to get the penalties high enough that it dissuades other people from cashing in and then paying, you know, a, a relatively small fine? Sure. I think a significant number of the folks that receive fines and enforcement are deterred by the fines and enforcement. In addition, this lawsuit has a cause of action for violations of the city's deceptive trade practices, which allows for full disgorgement. So we do have a cause of action that would allow us to pry out all of the illegal revenue uh, were we to go all the way through to the end of trial. Uh, and you can see from our website and prior announcements, uh, we routinely settle these cases for hundreds of thousands, if not over a million dollars. Mayor, I have a question on COVID since you brought that up. Um, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Um, is this city cracking down on the owners of one to two family homes who list their properties on, you know, Airbnb on the short term rental sites, or are you focusing on, you know, bigger multifamily? Sure. I'm glad you asked that question because it gives me a chance to clarify something. Uh, it's often misunderstood that it's only illegal in multiple dwellings, units with buildings with three or more. It is, in fact, illegal in one- and two-family homes as well. The rules are the same. You have to be there. You can't have more than two guests. Um, when you ask, are we cracking down, our enforcement priorities have always been to focus on commercial actors, people who are taking one or more units of housing off the market, dangerous actors, people who are creating really horrible overcrowding or illegal alteration or putting people in cellars with no lights and no windows, um, or disruptive actors, people who are disrupting the quality of life in their communities and neighbors. I think our, our history of enforcement shows that one in two families are being used. They're being bought by real estate speculators who are taking them out of the rental market market and turning them into homes. And they're also a critical component. It's almost a third of the city's rental stock with hundreds of thousands of rental units of one and two families that we cannot afford to lose to an unregulated market. And instead, we need those homes for New Yorkers. Sorry, I really can't hear you. What more, what more would we like Airbnb and others platforms to do? Um, well, once the registration law starts in 2023, uh, the platforms will be prohibited from processing unregistered transactions. What we'd like for them to do is comply with that law and work with us. It'll be the first time we will say these people are allowed to do this kind of activity, and it'll be up to them if they're going to comply with the law or if we'll have to bring an enforcement action against the companies. I would point out, you, you heard in my notes, all of this activity happened on Airbnb's watch. We, we found this building and this operation by using data from the company. And I'll leave, I'll leave it at that and let them answer what more they should do. Thank you.
Congratulations. <laughs> the wedding see. people love you. Huh? The wedding people. Uh, I like that. 500 weddings. You. They love you. Good seeing you, brother. <laughs> Thank you. Good job. So, for a few on topics before I bounce. Are you Miss Bernadette? <laughs> um, so, one COVID question and then one question on these um, stabbings of homeless people. Um, so, first, I'm curious, it seems like you're focused on severe hospitalizations and deaths, but are you concerned about long COVID? I was just talking with a friend who said she's having trouble with word retrieval six months after or six weeks after she had COVID. Are you concerned about long COVID? Yes, without a doubt. And we're not just looking at hospitalizations and deaths. Every morning, I am briefed by my medical team, every morning, on just COVID and monkeypox now. So we do this every morning. And we continue to go through our strategies from long-term COVID. We're doing things in H&H in &H and some of our other facilities of how to give people help and assistance that are dealing with long-term long COVID. A very dear friend of mine is dealing with long-term COVID and the impact. So we're concerned about the entire impact of COVID, not on our physical body, but the anatomy of our, anatomy of our economy. Uh, the, a mental health aspect of it, of how our children are learning. This is a holistic approach to dealing with a real issue. COVID is a formidable opponent. And I keep saying over and over again, if you don't pivot and shift, if you stay rigid, COVID will defeat you. And COVID is not defeating us because we're not rigid and we're continuing to move forward. We kept our schools open. People wanted us to close them. We did the right thing by the home testing, the right thing about masking. We did the right things. We continue to navigate the complexity of COVID, and we're leaving the, leading the country. The country is looking at what New York is doing, such as delivering uh, medicine home, uh, such as the testing operation. They're looking at what we're doing and seeing that New York has it right. Yes, we are concerned about long-term COVID. Uh, we don't know. The investigation is going to determine the outcome. Uh, we have a few leads. Uh, we will catch the person responsible. And it is unacceptable for an individual to uh, attack a person that's homeless or not homeless. And we are going to find this person responsible. We have a few leads, and we're, we're following up on those leads. I didn't see the video. Video. There must be new video out. Uh, anyone who carries out an assault of, of any nature should be held accountable for it. So if in that video it determines that she broke the law, uh, I believe uh, that the law must be enforced. But the district attorney makes the final outcome. Uh, my job is to continue to stand up. Uh, 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 and support those hardworking New Yorkers that should not be the victim of aggressive behaviors. Did you attorney about this case recently? And, and if so, what was the discussion about? What did you say to them? No, we, we had a conversation about the case. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to go into the private conversations. I shared my thoughts. He shared his thoughts. Uh, but uh, justice should be served here. And I am hoping that it is. Uh, we had a conversation yesterday. He was at our town hall yesterday, and we had a brief conversation. Mr. Mayor, back to COVID for a moment. Late last week, your health department recommended masking indoors, and since then, you've had several indoor events where you yourself haven't been masked. What message does that send to New Yorkers? Uh, that I, I have to do better, like everyone has to do better. You know, I'm perfectly imperfect. I must have said that a hundred times. And my uh, medical, uh, my uh, Department of Health Commissioner, we talked about it today. He says, you know, let's, you know, told the whole staff on the, on the call, let's continue to mask indoors. And some days we forget, we got to get it right. You know, some days we, we got to get it right. Being mayor is not perfection, it's dedication. I'm dedicated to navigating the city out of this crisis. And uh, I have my N95 in the cars, and as much as possible, I'm going to put it on because the, uh, he was right. And we need to always do a better job and lead by example. And that's what I'm going to attempt to do. Like a follow-up real quick. Given that 
more PCR testing sites are slated to close uh, in about a week. We're seeing the emphasis on at-home tests. How important for your strategy of mitigating COVID is it for the city to know about individual cases? It may not rise to the level of severity going into a hospital, but how important is it for the city to know about individual cases at this point? We talked about that today. Um, you know, I learned something in, uh, I think it was physics, called sampling of the population. Uh, you do not have to sample every individual to get an understanding of what you're dealing with. When you poll and see that I was the most popular candidate I was running, you didn't ask every New Yorker, you did a sampling of the population. We have enough, unlike other municipalities, we have enough data that is coming in that is allowing us to get a full understanding of where we are with COVID. We have clear records on hospitalization, clear records on death, clear records on ICU. So there's enough that's coming in that we can sample the population and see what we're dealing with. And at take home tests, is, that's the real win. Symptoms, test yourself right away, get the medicines delivered to you if need be, if you qualify. We put together a great approach to dealing with a formidable opponent that we call COVID. CBC. Mr. Mayor, uh, you? Uh, very good, sir. Uh, OEM is out with this new PSA about what to do in case there's a nuclear attack in New York City. Mm -hmm. I was curious what your take is on that. Is that alarmist? Is there something we should no, know? No, I don't think it was alarmist. Uh, I'm a big believer in better safe than sorry. I take my hat off to OEM. This was right after the attacks uh, in uh, the Ukraine. And OEM took a very proactive step to say, let's be prepared. And it doesn't mean just a nuclear attack. It's any natural disaster. Pack a bag. Uh, know where your medicines uh, are located. These are just smart things to do. And, you know, many of us, we think about COVID and, and other things that have been on the forefront. But we're still one of the top terrorist threats. Uh, there are no um, imminent threats to the city that we know about, uh, but we always have to be prepared, prepared as New Yorkers, and I think OEM did the right thing. We're going to always be proactive, not panic, but we're going to be prepared. Mr. Mayor, do you think uh, the Manhattan DA, Alvin Bragg, is an obstacle uh, for you to get your public safety goals? Uh, no, what I believe is an obstacle for me is the criminal justice system and lawmakers. Uh, well, I'm just giving you my overview. <laughs> um, I think that the criminal justice system and lawmakers have stopped putting in place initiatives that protect innocent people in this city and this country. We are protecting people who violate the law. I say let's start protecting people who follow the law. And that is what's disturbing to me. You can't have a police department that remove, removes 3,700 guns off the street. Last week, Commissioner Sewell gave a report of the number of repeated offenders arrested for burglary, back out on the street. Arrested for robbery, back out on the street. Carry a gun, back out on the street. That is just really in the way of everyday New Yorkers. We need to move in the direction of protecting innocent New Yorkers. So I don't want to pinpoint one DA or one lawmaker. The criminal justice system, I believe, has turned against the innocent people of this city and the men and women who are here to protect the city and the country. Okay, over here, last one. Um, why do you think it was acceptable to call protesters yesterday clowns um, when they were speaking out against budget? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Why do you think it was acceptable to call protesters clowns yesterday when they're speaking out against budget cuts in schools? Well, there's, there's a way for speaking out against uh, budget cuts. There's a way to disagree without being disagreeable. When you stand up and yell while your neighbors are talking and attempting to solve a problem, then you've turned the place into a circus. And one of the people in the circus is a clown. So when you do things that's clown-like, then you should be properly defined as what you are. You don't stand up at a peaceful conversation with your neighbors, yell, and then run towards the mayor, where my security detail is not going to allow you to run towards the mayor. They're responsible to ensuring safety, particularly with some of the um, issues that we're seeing in the city. So I saw clown-like behavior. 
and we're not going to tolerate clown-like behavior in our peaceful meetings. Oh, no, you got to keep, 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 get him. I haven't seen you in so long. It's been a while. And, I, you know, I miss your articles, you know. <laughs> and you got a Brooklyn shirt on. Come on, what are you, anti-Brooklyn? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chris. Chris. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it, it turns out that former Mayor de Blasio in um, 2019 was given specific guidance by the Conflicts of Interest Board that he could not charge taxpayers for the travel and lodging of his security detail when he was um, on his uh, political campaign for president. He was given that advice. He ended up charging taxpayers anyway for, for those costs, $320,000. And the Department of Investigation confirmed that violation in October. We're now about nine months after that. And I'm wondering whether you think that uh, the former mayor should be uh, penalized for that ethical violation and, uh, and whether the city is going to try to recoup the taxpayers' money. Well, uh, it's, it's COIB, which I believe, um, you know, they do an amazing job of determine, determining if someone uh, crosses the line in any way. And I think that's something that must go through COIB and of the, uh, the f uh, former mayor uh, to determine how to resolve the issue. Uh, that's beyond my scope. Uh, I reach out to COIB and get the rulings, and we attempt to the best of our abilities to follow those rulings. Uh, and I think the mayor and the, uh, the COIB and, you know, the Corporation Council, whatever entities that are involved in that, they need to look at that. I, I got to focus on uh, being a mayor of the city of New York, and so I don't have an opinion on that. Uh, my opinion is not going to matter. If my opinions matter, my brother will be doing my security. <laughs> Yes. On the OAM video, uh, you were saying specifically it's what's going on in Ukraine that prompted that video. Did I understand? Yeah, it was. It was uh, of, of my briefing because when I saw it and heard it, I thought it was a great idea. Of uh, my understanding is that it was uh, really taking set, taking necessary steps. Uh, after what happened in Ukraine to give preparedness. But not only, it's not only nuclear, we need to be clear on that, it's preparedness. We're, to, we're going to continuously put out, as we move into hurricane season, we're going, we're going to put out a series of PSAs, a series of announcements about preparedness. We're in this preparedness space because the worst thing we could happen is not to tell people prepared and then Bernadette come and ask me and say, Eric, why are you going to tell people they were prepared? So I have to, I have to think ahead of time and making sure we make the right step. But it was focusing on preparedness, and that was one of the conversations about making sure you do the right things that needs to be prepared. Thank, thank. One, <laughs> one quick thing on COVID. Uh, late last week at Maimonides, you mentioned that you're looking at developing new weapons in the fight against COVID. I was just wondering, do you have an update on kind of what those new weapons are going to look like? And then separately, you also said that you're looking to bring in experts from across the globe. And I'm wondering, can you share it? Yeah, no, no, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, so this uh, uh, COVID battle, what we're going to do, uh, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene's commissioner, we're going to bring in experts all across the globe to host an event. Uh, I believe is in formation now uh, to get lessons learned. What have we learned? Uh, what could we do differently? How do we communicate with New York? You know what our biggest issue, Chris, is that the same thing that happened um, during 9-11, you know, people get comfortable. And so sometimes when your eyes don't see what the concerns are, you sort of get comfortable in the process. And so we need ways of communicating with New Yorkers to understand why we have to stay remain vigilant. And so that's what we're going to bring in experts to look at lessons learned. As we look at these new variants, uh, what did you learn in your municipalities, uh, behavioral scientists? We're going to bring in everyone in this space so we can learn. And New York is going to host this and lead the way. We're going to ask uh, people to join us, uh, uh, men and women from academia. Uh, we, want, we want a real public-facing conversation about COVID so we can plan for the future.
brought up because of an FDA snafu? I know you wrote the letter yesterday. Yes, we sent over, we sent over a letter yesterday. Uh, you know, we have uh, we have a couple of thousand now that we're doing. You know, so we're gonna we gotta get you now. <laughs> we're gonna we, we're sending a letter. We hope that we release as much as possible. We have uh, really the proportionally we should get more. And so we're communicating with the White House in order to get that done. Okay, thanks everybody. Appreciate it. Gotta run.